Welcome to Team O'Neill. I'm Chris. I'm joined by the, the owners of SimCraft here. Um, we're talking about simulation driving and training. Uh, my goal is to go racing, as you guys know, and we're going to be able to test out some sims. But also, too, we've been working with SimCraft and Team O'Neill for a long time. Travis Hansen's trained Sean, and we've had some military contracts even in, in the sim world. So this is our real chance to apply this to real world racing training and then maybe even uh, something with Team O'Neill in the future. But could you guys introduce yourselves real quick? Sure. I'm Sean Patrick McDonald. I'm the co-founder and chief technology officer at SimCraft. And I'm Matthew Thill. I'm the director of motorsports. Perfect. Yeah. So these boys were willing to let me come here and test out some equipment. These uh, things are as expensive as a race car and we're going to talk about why that is and all the technology and components that are in these sim units. But I want to get your guys' input on what is your experience with using sim for race training or for any sort of training? What have you guys experienced up to this point? I think this Please. is where I jump in first. Right. Um, I was originally a customer of SimCraft before I became part of the management and ownership group. Uh, I went to Skip Barber Racing School, grew up at Road America in Wisconsin, and wanted a driver development tool for myself. Drove all the sim equipment in the market. Right. There was only one that I could drive and there was only one that I could stand and figured out how to get some equipment and started my race training. Right. And um, used it religiously during my short career as a uh, race car driver. Uh, obviously, you never stop race car driving. Um, <laughs> so utilized the tool as best as I could and fell in love with it and um, figured out a way to become part of the management and ownership group a couple of years later. And uh, it's invaluable time. It's invaluable time. There's, it's nothing different. Perfect. Sean, where did this come from? Where did SimCraft start? Like, how did we get to here? You're 25 years into this? 25 years since my father first um, worked on SimCraft. So SimCraft okay. was a, uh, it was actually a retirement project for him. Really? Yep. Uh, he was an uh, Eastman Kodak vet up in Rochester, New York, where I grew up. Uh, he was there 29 years, and a couple years before he retired, he had an idea um, how to build an aviation sim, a three-off roll-pitch yaw uh, unit for himself, for his own personal enjoyment. Okay. Um, he was not uh, a wealthy man, retired comfortably, but uh, didn't have a ton of money to invest in this, this idea. Um, but he um, was very capable and uh, electrically engineer, uh, electrical engineer training. Okay. Um, I think you know he was uh, in charge of government contracts at Eastman Kodak for the last ten years of his career, and I think you know that pulled him away from the creative side of you know work. Right. And I think his his mind just continued to you know to think about how to create things and how to make things on the engineering side and. He, um, he built a three-off unit uh, for his own enjoyment and spent about $1,000 doing it. He built it out of dimensional lumber, paid very close attention to the, the materials um, that he, he used um, just to save some money, but also, more importantly, he conceived that if he were to take a cockpit and balance it at the center of mass, that he could move it quite easily without a lot of force. And that was sort of the novel concept uh, that we still use today in our equipment um, he built gimbals around the cockpit, so the cockpit was supported on each side, so for pitch axis, uh, pitched uh, you know up and down. He had another gimbal on the uh, front and back for for roll motion, okay. and then uh, one on top for yaw. And his degrees of freedom were intersecting at the center of mass of the cockpit, just like we still do. Wow, um, it was sort of an accidental discovery because. His intent was to build an inexpensive flight sim. Right. Um, and it's taken us years to figure out why it, it feels so correct well. and try to articulate that to the people that actually care to know. Wow. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, he built his flight sim in 1998, um, which is the 25 year mark for SimCraft. Nice. I flew it that, uh, that winter uh, for about 15, 20 minutes. And um, my dad passed suddenly in 2002. Uh, I was in a software career and always looking for more um, and felt from that 15 to 20 minute experience I had in my father's uh, SimCraft version one, unit one, that there might be something here. Like mm -hmm. there's something about this that 
perhaps we can explore and develop into a product and, um, and here we are. Wow. How did aviation go to race cars? Where, is that your interest? Um, well, yeah, a little bit. I mean, I think um, there, was, there was really two reasons for that. The okay. first was um, the available software um, to actually interface with and use on the sim uh, was more extensive in racing. Um, but I think uh, as an engineer myself, the, the idea of convincing a professional race car driver that the sim is giving them the proper feedback to make these very fast, very quick decisions, the sim's reacting in time so that it's, you know, essentially contributing to their total immersion into the uh, environment, mm -hmm. that that was a way more challenging application than aviation. Not to say that aviation simulation is simple or trivial, right. but the demands of a car moving at speed through a forest or through right. a, down a, a road course, you know, there's a lot of different motions occurring on the vehicle, and they're they're quick, they're fast. The driver is making these quick and fast decisions, so it makes a more challenging application. And the idea was, if we can get that right, then all the other stuff we can do in driver's simulation, driver's education, or in aviation simulation, they would be, um, once again, not trivial, right. but much easier to accomplish. Right. So obviously, there's, there's no question for the training that we do, seat time is everything, right? Yeah. So what we're trying to do is get seat time in a, in a closed box. Yeah. Is that effectively what sim racing is about sure. right now? Yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely. And, and what is your favorite software that you guys have been using? What's kind of been the most cohesive with your equipment? Well, since 2008, we've been working with the iRacing Motorsport platform, uh, Boston, Massachusetts, USA company. Right. Um, they, the uh, up at the rally school. Yeah, <laughs> and, and you know, they've been really supportive of our efforts. Um, in the big key differentiator they started with and continue to do today is laser scan tracks. So if you're using a tool to develop, um, to train, and you're expecting to show up at that environment, that track, um, and be prepared, well, what's present in the sim has to be the same or as close as possible to what's present in the real world. And since this, the laser scan tracks were really the first, um, iRacing was the first to offer those in the platform, it was, it was a pretty easy decision. Right. Um, in addition to their support, um, great people that work there, um, and since that time in 2008, they have added every form of motorsport on four wheels. Right. Um, so it's essentially a, a full suite of motorsports, whatever you want to do. Um, some of our clients that work hard training will spend two or three hours in the sim doing their work, and then they'll take a different, completely different car out, out, you know, just to have some fun. Right. Just like we do in the real world, yeah, try exactly, to anyways. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yep. So Matthew, you've done this in the real world. You've used this for training. You've actually done racing. What have you found the most valuable time in the sim versus when you go to the track? And like, where did you find the most value in sim training? Well, I think the big thing for what we do is taking the identical approach that you would in real life to this. Um, the, the benefits that we have specifically because the car, the, the the hardware feels like a car. Right. So you don't have to actually learn how to drive the hardware. You just drive it like a car. So the acclimation period to get in our equipment right. and get up to speed pretty quickly doesn't require a lot of adaptation for your mind. Right. You just jump right in and you can go. Right. We find that a lot of our professional drivers will, will say the same things. So working on your skill sets, doing the exact same things that you would in your approach to real world racing, right. Um, this is a very good complement to what you're doing at the real world racetrack. Um, clearly there's no substitute for real world experience, but this is about the closest you can get to that. Right. And having this type of tool for me specifically mm -hmm. is, you know, they, they talk about 10,000 hours in a race car before right. you have proficiency. Right. Well, in today's day and age, you can't get that in a real world environment without the spending gas, millions tires, of the dollars. Yeah. At the race millions track. Logistically of dollars. Logistically impossible as well. Right. <laughs> so to be able to prepare for, you know, a world finals like some of our drivers do without right. having to go to mm -hmm. Europe and be able to, to focus on the amount of absorbent costs that it would take to get there, they can do it at the luxury of their own home, right. in, their, in their car garage, in their office, wherever. But constantly doing the exact same things that you would do in real life to the approach to driving our hardware specific, specifically 
is, is everything. Mm -hmm. And the more seat time that you get, the better your real world experiences are gonna be. And there's right. times where I've gone to, now keep in mind, my race career wasn't <laughs> anything of professional level. Sure. Um, well, I had aspirations. We want to yeah. win. We I had aspirations growing up at Road America. Like one day I'm going to do this, and sure. admiring some of uh, our peers now that we work with, growing up has been has been pretty surreal to to be able to work with them in in, in what we do. Sure. Um, but there's times where I've prepped for race courses never have been, been there, right. but because I have thousands of hours in our equipment, it's, it's no different. Right. It's no different. Yeah, mine was Pikes Peak, right? Yep. For me, a rally guy living in Colorado, wanting to go up Pikes Peak, and then I've been able to go up Mount Washington a few times, and iRacing supported that uh, this last round. So I'm starting to see the value, and that's you know, a big reason why I'm here, is I wanna learn as much as I can about sim. I wanna teach our community as much as they can, because. I think there's no question at this point the value, right? right. But now, like, what's, what, what's the right decision? How do we make decisions? How do we decide what's the right equipment tools yeah. set up? And that's what we're going to do some more videos for you guys here, show you a little bit more. I'm going to get in the sim and, and try them out and see how I do. And, and uh, please watch our next videos and leave any comments if you have any for uh, any other questions that you have for these guys because they're definitely very great at answering questions. You guys have been amazing so far. So Sometimes I'm even long-winded though, Chris. No, that's okay. <laughs> we, it's, our community likes the, the real answer and sometimes it takes a few sentences to get there. Yeah. So I appreciate that. So look forward to our next videos and we'll, we'll talk to you guys soon. Thanks guys.